Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to the Dark Stoa with Pat Ryan. I'm your host, Daniel Kazanjan. And for the uninitiated, these events tend to deal with slightly more challenging subject matter. Sometimes they prompt existential horror, and sometimes they blow your mind a little bit and they make you think. So consider yourself warned. Uh, the structure for tonight is pretty simple. In a moment, I'm going to hand it over to Pat, and he's going to take us through a really interesting, mind-bending presentation. And throughout this presentation, I encourage everybody to write down any questions that come up, any ways that you want to challenge Pat, anything you don't understand. And then we'll shift over to Q&A, and we'll send them to the floor, and people can have some dialogue with Pat Ryan. Um, yeah, and without further delay, I give you Pat Ryan. Howdy, folks. Welcome back. Thanks for coming back. Um, last string of episodes have been fairly... Oh, oh, first, is my volume okay? Okay, great. <clears throat> um, first uh, couple episodes of this have been kind of like... Uh, uh, this one, I'm going to pump the brakes a bit. Because um, I'm sure if you've been following along, you might be asking yourself the question, does he have any morality at all? Um, the answer is going to be answered uh, with this presentation, which is called the morality machine, uh, belief as a technology. So the word belief is pretty loaded. Everyone has their own personal definition of it. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to fight each and every one of you on it. And uh, so bear with me as I go along. I'm going to attempt to explain how how neural networks actually work without ever getting into the technicality of it. Because they're pretty complicated. By themselves in principle, they're simple, but if you're not initiated to that kind of thing, um, it's pretty daunting. Um, they make a lot of assumptions, and unfortunately, neural networks themselves aren't following any type of systematized logical approach. It's all very haphazardly discovered as we go along. So I'm gonna do my best to frame how a neural network works exclusively in philosophical terms. And that should hopefully be a useful bridge to then explore um, some of our hair trigger inclinations when it comes to questions of moral decision making. Um, and uh, that's as best of a summary as I can come up with. Let me share the screen and let's get started. Oh no, you have to enable screen sharing, sir. Excellent. Let us begin. Cool. Let me get all this stuff uh, situated. Oh, that's wrong. Go back. There we go. Okay. Uh, I think we're good here. Okay. Uh, morality Machine, if anybody's played Chrono Trigger, one of my favorite games, this scene blew my mind when I was a kid. Uh, also, I'm still experimenting with a VPN sponsorship, so if you want to have a crack at beating some quantum computers, wild, apparently that's going to be a thing, um, try these guys out. You can QR code this or the URL. Okay, so moving on. Get these things out there. Okay, so. We're going to talk about categorical correspondence, which is a fancy way of saying, um, does this category correspond to this category? Now, it doesn't have to be a tight category. If I was to say shapes correspond to triangles, that's a, that's a correspondence. If I was to say um, uh, mugs of coffee correspond to cats, I'd have to work a little bit harder to make the correspondence. So I'm basically, I'm, this is about making taking a concept and figuring out what category that concept belongs in is what we're kind of always doing with logic and trying to determine these things. Now you can do hard categorization, say this thing is absolutely in this category, or you can do kind of a Gaussian categorization where you say this is about 40% in this category and 30% in this other category. And this is the kind of rationale we use to start evaluating moral systems to begin with. 
we always start in this typing categorical process. Um, and it's made more relevant, especially in a time when we have surrounded ourselves with so much technology that is all just a direct extension of set theory anyways. So from set, you get type, from type you get category, and so forth and so on. So the we have put ourselves in this position where our morality is now being shaped not only by us, but by our desire to make our morality representable within machines. And we're able to do that because we have the internet. The internet is a way where we can reach out and poke one another and say, did I poke you and get the behavior I want? If the answer is no, then the poking will continue. And as a result, we just keep iterating and coming up with these new ways to jam our morality in these machines. And the way we're doing that right now, as of 2020, is through neural networks. So I'm gonna walk you through it real quick. And if you know how this stuff works, please bear with me. I'm doing my best to bridge it in philosophical terms. Okay, so let's say I have a brightness sensor. It's, uh, you've all seen these things. They, you, you walk near a garage and it kicks on a light because of a motion sensor. Right, that's, that's kind of a brightness sensor or an IR sensor or anything along those lines. So there's something out there reading light or heat or something. And as it's exposed to that heat, it then represents the intensity in a numeric form. It could say, ah, well, it's about, let's say that 256 is as bright as it can handle and zero is as dark as it can handle, right? So everything in between is a gradient of brightness, right? From zero, which is absolute dark, to 256, which is absolute brightness, right? So in this case, I have a set of these values. This is the brightness that the brightness sensor just happened to get in some random sample of time that I just picked for convenience, okay? So what I'm doing is each one of these lines will carry what's called a weight, meaning I'm going to say, hey, 256 to the dark, quite for, um, for the assessment of how dark 256 is, there's going to be a weight here that explains exactly what that means. So 256, remember that's as bright as it gets. To the dark categorizer, it's going to say that's zero dark because this is bright as it gets. Now, if I, if I sent zero to the dark categorizer, that would be 100% dark, right? So each one of these lines carries the bias that the categorizer uses to make the evaluation. So if I sent it uh, 128, which is half of 256, I send it to the bright categorizer, it says that's 50% bright. And if I send it to dark, it's also going to say it's 50% dark. So that's pretty straightforward, right? So I say uh, 64 in this case, I send it to bright, that should be around, if I can do my math right, that's like 75%, uh, no, it's 25% bright and 75% dark, right? So it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a formal way of representing um, the weights and what comes out of it. So what we're doing is we're taking these events, these brightness events, and we're encoding the value. We're en wow, that's a terrible place to put that. Uh, we're encoding the value as a category, basically. That's all we're doing here, right? So if you see these graphs, you, you now know what these graphs are actually doing. Um, now, I'm not going to get into hidden layers because I don't want to chase anyone out. In fact, I'm, I'm going to save that for last, so just pump your brakes a bit, right? So just to walk this through, um, I, this is my training. I'm training my categorizers to understand this stuff so that when I hit it with a value it's never seen before, in this case, 76, because I didn't start with 76, what's going to happen is I'm going to run it through this network and it's going to tell me that it's 29% bright. The categorizer will tell me that and the dark will tell me the inverse. So pretty straightforward, kind of, as best as I can put it. So we're doing a categorical assessment of a new event. This new, 76 is a new event, that's a new brightness that hasn't been there before. The machine, uh, the categorizers are able to say, you know, it's this bright or it's this dark, right? Pretty straightforward. So let's switch it up a bit. Let's make it about morality. Instead of light and dark, let's do good and evil. Now we're gonna open up all kinds of problems because I just said the two magic words that make this a big problem. What is evil, what is good? Well, that depends upon what behavior are you, quanti are you quantifying as morality? You know, what's, what's the value here? Are you 256 what? $256 you donated? Is it 256 times you hugged your kid? What, what is this value representing here, right? 
So we can have infinite questions about what these numbers should be. These things will work. There's no doubt about that. If I, if these things will absolutely categorize whatever the hell I train it. So now we got to step back and say, what are we, what are you categorizing here? Really? I mean, is, can you even do this type of thing? So that's like red flag number one. That's a uh, behavior as quantified morality. Who, who's labeling these values? Right? Who's coming up with these numbers? And who's actually able to like agree to those numbers and comport to them, right? So uh, the problems are starting to amass from the jump. If I give it 76 using the same exact model from the previous slide, then 76 is 29% good. So whenever people say, well, it's not about good and evil, it's the gray area in between, congratulations, I've given that gray area a number. It's now 29%, you are 29% good. I can now measure your grayness, right? So now our morality is starting to, um, it's starting to turn into an interesting thought experiment. Before morality was the, the measure of, of man's inaction or man's action with itself and other people and the world and the universe and being and reason and trying to formulate all that stuff. And now I'm, this is how machines see it. This is how AI will take these deep problems that we've enamored ourselves with and it will spit it out into these distributions, these percentage distributions. And that's what it's currently doing right now regarding how, how much hate speech exists in a, in a post, how much, uh, how offensive a meme is, um, is this is a is a piece of web content uh, uh, um, you know the basic stuff uh, offensive and stuff like that right so that may sound good and that's how they sell it they're eliminating hate speech and that kind of thing but this is what it looks like I mean this is what it actually looks like at the mathematical scale which is again we know the problems of trying to quantify morality as behavior values uh, the problems don't go away when we extend and we, we go further, it gets worse, in fact. Um, so what I've tapped into is this, this unending holy war about not only the quantification of, of the moral behavior you're trying to measure, uh, now we talk about categorization errors. That 76 is 29% good. Well, it turns out the fan club of 76, they're really pissed about that rating. They know that they're better than 29%. In fact, they have the historical evidence. They can say, God damn it, we are not 29% good. We are at least 80%. Now you have these holy wars about the outcomes of these things to begin with because your priors were all wrong. Your values were all wrong. And then here they come. Oh, my God, there's a million litany of reasons as to why this value is bad. It's, they're just going to yell at you all day. And oh, by the way, they also have unaccountable influence of Silicon Valley. So they can ban you from PayPal and Stripe and your life, basically. So... It, it, these people are very upset, and this is just a, a stereotype I'm throwing out there because the internet's a lovely place. Um, they, they're very upset about this, this 29%, right? This is bad. Uh, they, they are not happy with that numbers. In fact, it's, there's, there's systemic reasons and socioeconomic conditions, and just, they just keep throwing just books and books of, of perverted sociology at you until you just say, fine, I'll fucking change a number, right? So how do I change a number? I have to calculate the loss. And that's a math term, and I apologize, but I have to calculate the loss, to, or more correctly, in philosophical terms, the categorization error, meaning that, 20, that 76 was not supposed to be 29%, because this person's real pissed off, and they put a gun to my head, so I better make it 80%. So how do I do that? Well, I got to take the 29% that, is, uh, that it's done, I got to run this creature through it, and then I can calculate my loss. So I got my loss, and now I have to reapply it back to my categorization methodology. So that looks like this. I take my loss and I start affecting my weights. Remember, these are the weights. These are the things that inform the categorization that say, yes, okay, 256 means this and evil and 256 means this and good. But our, the person who put the gun to our head says, uh, that's, that's mean and they're calling these things racist and these things aren't racist. It, this, <laughs> this is the problem right here. It's not these things. These things are just doing whatever you train them to do. It's not even calculating the loss is the problem. It's not even the weights or the biases that are the problem. It's actually this insane idea that you can quantify morality. That's where the problem is. But we don't care. We don't want to do that. We've sunk way too many billions of dollars in these machines. And God damn it, I want to return on investment. So we're going to tweak the loss instead. So now we're going to take that loss and we're going to apply it to all of our weights. 
And now suddenly 76 is 80% good. Well, we did, we did it. We hacked the numbers. Woohoo! Yay us, right? We, uh, we, we represented the, the exception in our moral framework and we baked it in the machine. So when the machine sees the 76 again, it will make the appropriate categorization, which means the gun that's against our head will back off slowly, right? So we did it, right? We're not making moral assessments anymore. We're compensating for people with power. Well, now we're no longer talking about morality. We did it, right? We have now jumped the shark. But we don't want to keep we we don't want to catch ourselves jumping the shark because that gun can come back anytime, you know, it can come in your birthday, your Tuesday. You don't want that shit, right? So oh damn it. It's not good enough. 80% wasn't good enough. Shit. She puts it higher. She puts it 90%. It's it's she has a million more reasons now why that's not good. Oh god, now we gotta do this again. Oh, okay, fine. Well, all right, well, we'll just apply the laws again, right? We know how to do this. It's not the end of the world. We know how to do this. We're gonna do it. Okay, so we're going to take the loss and something's interfering with humanist progress and it's up to us. It is our holy crusade to do this. It's, we, we got this, people. We got this. We know how to do this. So we take the loss because we know how to take the loss and we know how to apply it to the next iteration. Each one of these is it's like an iteration of every time I apply the loss. So I'm applying the loss to change the weights so the categories are better. So let's do it again. And we're going to keep on doing it. We're going to keep on doing it till we get that number we're looking for. We're going to just, we're going to, Right, we gotta hack this damn thing. We're gonna get that number. And we got this, we, we got this. We know we got this. Wait, hold on. What do you mean the percentage changed zero, 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 one? Hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh God, she's back. Oh no, like what are we gonna do about this? I, I, I changed the numbers, I did the thing. I did the thing, I, I, I made the loss. Like what the hell, what did I do wrong? What is going on here? Well now, in addition to compensating for someone with a gun, uh, we are now fighting the machine itself. So now we're not even talking about morality anymore. That's just out. We gave that up like two slides ago, right? Now we're talking about, now we got to fight the machine. Okay, so now I promise to keep the technical away. I have to delve into this a little bit. Uh, just, this is the time to write questions if you have them. So what's going on here? Well, I've, I've been showing you the categorizers as like the, that's like the end of the neural network, there's actually these things called hidden layers in between them. I don't want to get into them because I think the name itself is confusing for people who don't know it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent those hidden layers as feature detectors. So um, think of a feature as, uh, think of a feature as, if there, if there are categories for good and evil, then a feature would be a subset of properties for what is good and what is bad. And that's just, that's just the wrong definition, but that's the best I got for right here. Um, okay, so we're gonna go through these features about the, the, the categorical, the means in which the categorical, the categorical correspondence is evaluated. That's what these features are doing. So for example, we're, we're gonna pump our numbers in and the neural network has come up with four, uh, a layer made of four nodes. And it just turns out that they happen to represent these kind of things. I'm just throwing names on there just for now, just for labeling and, and comprehension reasons. You'll never get labels in an actual neural network, by the way. You can't actually examine this stuff. Um, so like maybe, maybe nervousness is a part of morality or emotional sentiment averaging or some weird pattern, some, some correspondence correlation mechanism, right? And then that passes to the next layer. And I'm just gonna say, you know, maybe this layer is looking for these things. And then it passes to the next layer. And maybe it's looking for these things. And when it goes through this whole thing, that's how it makes its actual categorization. So you start with your 256. It's jumping here. It's, it's giving you the, it jumps here, does the product to here, the product to here, and then you get your evaluations and so forth. Like I said, these are just placeholders to convey a concept. Uh, if you want to look into how hidden layers actually work, feel free. Um, there are way better resources out there that, uh, than, than I'm currently providing. But this is just to demonstrate Again, our problem is that the person has the gun to our head and we weren't able to change percentage. And we got to change percentage or they're going to shoot us. So what the hell, right? So what's happening? Oh, now she's back. And now she's actually in the layers and she's saying, well, this doesn't represent all of reality. This doesn't represent all the moral things. We can have infinitely more layers. We, we can have layers for, I don't know, how many giraffes did you lick last week? Like that's a moral thing, right? We can throw that in there. I mean, we may have to, she, she has a gun. I mean, what are we going to do? So, all right, so we'll, we'll get to the problem. I, I try to tell her, I say, we can't add more layers because that's actually the problem. It won't do anything. 
She doesn't get it. She doesn't understand it. She just wants the, the moral victory. She wants the political victory, right? So it, the reason why adding more layers doesn't work is because a thing called vanishing gradients. Vanishing gradients are a, if you remember the last talk where I focused on infinitesimals, infinitesimals are back and they are causing problems. So we calculate our loss, uh, which we've done uh, just, just as we do because we're trying to correct. And then what happens is the loss just say the loss just happened to be like 0.1 for whatever reason. So, so we apply it backwards, we propagate it backwards into these weights to change it so that when this spits out values, we say, well, your values need to be modified a bit. And so we can get better results here. But in the process of doing so, it's, it may then apply a little bit less to the layer behind it. And now we're, this one spits out evaluations, we modify that and it puts it in here. And then this modification might happen. The moment this happens, you're fucked, you're done, it's over. Because this change is so tiny, it's so infinitesimally vanishing that any change here or here or here or here, because the change here is so small, when it propagates through, you're gonna be stuck with the same value over and over again. Because you have to do heavy changes here in order to get this network to do its categorization properly. If the, if the, if the loss compensation goes here and it's so tiny, then nothing you do can ever matter. No amount of layers you add, no amount of nodes you add could ever change the outcome of your good evil analysis. So this is what I said, this is what I mean when you're fighting the machine. You're fighting just the way that this whole thing is structured. Um, and if this happens, you get the vanishing gradient. Uh, and that's why she's mad. She's really upset. She doesn't understand the vanishing gradient. She just wants a moral victory. So I try to sit her down and say, hey, the vanishing gradient. She doesn't care. She puts two guns in my head because, God damn it, now she really needs the answer. I was like, okay, all right, fine, fine. I'll hack it. I will come up with some crazy hack. We can make this work. We'll make this work. I swear to God, just, just, I, I give it one more time. I, I say that it, it, I'm just saying it became prematurely infinitesimal. We change the weights between the, wear, uh, the, the layers and it has no effect. So adding more, like I tell her all this stuff, but uh, fine, fuck it. I'll just, I'll just hack it, right? I'll come up with a deep belief network, right? So I'm going to use a deep belief network to solve this problem because I, I just, I just get the guns out of here. So the same setup, but instead what I'm doing, um, instead of calculating the loss and applying it in, individually in sequence backwards, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, let me, let me change how these are processing. So these are restricted Boltzmann machines. Um, and what that, it's a fancy way of saying that um, the inputs here lead to a certain output here, but it can also reconstruct the output to regenerate the input. So what this means is instead of just dumbly passing things along, what this will do is it will come, it will basically process the inputs in a way that is locally relevant to itself. So it's not sitting here waiting for the next activity. It's, it's able to come up with an equilibrium within itself. And this is true for each layer. And the reason that's important is because when we calculate our loss, we then do it, fine tune it everywhere at the same time, not backwards in the sense where it hits here, then it hits here, and then it hits here. We can actually fine tune the loss difference completely differently. And so by doing it this way, you end up in a very unique position where you can add more layers freely and you don't ever hit that problem with the, with the vanishing gradient, which is completely eliminated. Um, so you can fine tune each one of these layers who are taking the responsibility of categorizing the inputs themselves. Now, this solution is useful, but it's also incredibly difficult to train. Um, even in this example, you'll see the problem. You'll say, well, um, this is probably a good tribal way of looking at the problem. And then the religious people over here have a way. And then the, the humanists have a way. And how do I synchronize all these people? Well, that's exactly the same problem you'll have here. If you try to, if you, if you think of this in a philosophical manner. Um, so it's, it's, this is a solution to the vanishing gradient, but it's also incredibly difficult to implement correctly. Um, yeah, so. To escape the problem of infinitesimals, the first layer is, oh, and then there's the other trick where you, uh, you have known weights to what works. So at the very first layer, you're taking a successful model that was, that was processed somewhere else and bolting it on right at the beginning as well. So you might remember we were talking about morality at some point, and now we're not. Now we're talking about hacking a machine to get, to get moral. I mean, we, we, 
we were off the reservation at this point. But we're not going to stop because there's too much money in it, goddammit. And you're probably confused, right? You started out with, I just want to calculate moral behavior, right? That's all I want to do. That can't be that damn hard. Well, it turns out it is. Because um, now you're fighting the limits of the machine. So calculating morality is a remarkably difficult task, and we're still hell-bent on doing it. Of course, well, she knows the answer. We'll just add more layers and put her in charge, and they'll just tweak the, the, the biases all day long, and just don't question anything, and it'll be fine, obviously, duh. We're all conspiracy theorists if you disagree. Um, but that's just not it. I mean, this, there's, you're up against problems that involve energy economics. That's really what you're fighting against here. Because even if you add more layers, it, it doesn't necessarily mean more intelligence. And adding more data doesn't mean better results either. Because each one of these is a calculation. It takes energy to calculate these things. This is expensive stuff. I mean, you may have seen the, uh, the video of Mario Brothers, the character um, beating an AI training Mario to go through the first level of Mario Brothers, right? That cost $10,000 to train. Yeah, yeah, 10,000, right? I can sit my, like a child in front of that and beat it like a, a $2 sandwich and the child's gonna beat Mario Brothers, right? That's a, the, the nerds have said $10,000 is an acceptable cost to do this, and we're not going to question our a priori uh, uh, concepts. We're not going to question our approach to this thing. We're just going to bolt on more layers, man. We're doing it. We're just going to keep doing it. We're going to scale horizontally and just make more GPUs everywhere. And you can't. That doesn't make things more intelligent. We've seen how. We've seen how it doesn't work, right? We Look at this, right? That's a mess. So instead of taking this naive approach, maybe it's important to take the person with the gun and get them out of the equation. Let's get that person out of there, right? Because that person is skewing the results. They're, they're selecting for criteria that is incorrect. Um, they're biasing the research tremendously in their moral crusade. And just get them out of here. Just fucking get rid of them because they're interfering with actual progress at this point. Um, and that, that dollar sign, right? That's the dollar sign. That's the, that's the hard limit we're up against. So there is one technique, and this is actually patented by Google. So they actually did one thing right for once. Um, this is called dropout. And dropout is a very interesting technique because they've accidentally made a neural network perform the equivalence of belief, and they don't know it yet. So what is dropout? Well, we've seen how all this stuff works, how each one of these lines is a weight and a bias, and that determines how this thing categorizes, which then is a weight and a bias and categorizes, and we end up with our good evil distribution percentage. Um, what if I knock one out? What if I knock two out? What if I knock that one out? So knockout is, uh, there, there are different rhythms to knock out. You can either uh, remove the node at random or at set intervals or under different conditions or whichever. So what this does, this actually defeats a very serious problem in your moral assessments where you may say, well, 256 has a pretty good nonviolence rating, but according to the Hindus, it does this thing in population. If you go back a couple of steps before the knockouts and you say, okay, well, it turns out that these two things end up being related somehow. So, the in, so it, it is very feasible. You'll end up in a scenario where the Christian ranking and the Islamic ranking end up directly influencing one another. And that's not a result you want because now you're not getting a, a, a good representation of either one of these things. You actually want these two things to operate independently so that you can get a proper assessment of what they're doing. But if they end up in a scenario uh, just because of how the training worked or the value that they're dealing with, they will end up sometimes in a scenario where uh, one's ability to process will have an interlocking ability to interfere with this one's processing as well. So what you do is you knock them out. Uh, by knocking them out, the neural network, or the categorizational process, I should say, uh, what it will do is it will find paths around. 
to actually go through and say, okay, well, I don't need that dependency. I'll, I'll redo it this way. And so what you're able to do is you're able to curate these, these hidden layers in a way to where it is, you're, el you're eliminating path dependency, which is another way of saying um, uh, cor um, correlating, correlating values, which I don't think is the right word, I'm sorry. Um, so in doing this, what you're actually doing is more similar to what the brain is doing as opposed to anything else that, that we looked at. There's an entire army of, of uh, AI scientists who are convinced the brain does backpropagation. And backpropagation is that, that vanishing gradient thing. There's an entire army of people who are convinced that's what our brain is doing. And there's absolutely no evidence. It's, it's just, it's all hope. It's not real. Um, this is more close to what the brain is doing than anything else that I've seen in, in the AI space. Now, why is that? Um, because one, you're forcing the AIs, you're forcing the categorizational process to do more with less connections. So you're forcing it to be energy efficient. So instead of solving the problem the way you want to solve it, because you're a moral paragon and you never make mistakes, right? Uh, instead of doing that, you say, well, let this thing solve it, but it doesn't solve the morality. It just solves the energy efficiency. Which sounds a little weird. You wouldn't, it's almost like deferring morality to like an accountant which can go wrong pretty bad, pretty quickly. But it turns out, well, each neuron is an accountant too. It has its inputs of energy and it has its outputs and it has its waste. So there's an accounting process in every part of cognition. Dropout allows us to say, oh, now there's an accounting process here too. And so now we're getting more in sync with how cognition actually works through a dropout uh, process. And, only, and the only reason we're getting close to that cognitive model is because we're solving energy efficiency problems. We're not actually solving for morality. We're not fighting the network anymore. We're letting the network resolve energy efficiency problems. And that's how you get much better answers. Well, this discrimination because, oh, uh, God damn it, she's back because now I'm knocking out Hinduism and I can't hawk that knockout because I got to represent all the morality. I have to represent all of it at all times, but then I get the vanishing gradient problem, but then I can't solve it. Uh, get these people out of here, right? They don't have the spinal fortitude to handle what has to be done. So here's an example of, of belief management with energy effectiveness, right? So imagine a world where we do what um, these moral police say, and we have to represent every moral conundrum possible in our, in our categorizational process in order to make any assessment whatsoever. Um, do you think our brain adds more neurons on demand when we solve a problem? That's, that'd be ludicrous. In fact, the neuron itself has, a, has all the capacity to go through mitosis. It's all there. The DNA is functioning. Nucleus is there. It's just, it just doesn't. It just doesn't go through mitosis. But imagine if it did, right? You might think, ah, well, the neuron went through mitosis. We'd be super smart. Well, I, I just walked you through why it wouldn't. <laughs> we just went through why that wouldn't be the case. So it turns out the brain is dealing with uh, a, a non-scalable machine in order to solve its problems. And let me give you a demonstration. Uh, this ball is a whole bunch of photons bouncing off it or a Brazilian events per second. Uh, this is being dumped in the brain, which is heavy dump in the brain. Now, meanwhile, the poor brain is like, oh, okay, it's a ball, it's a ball that, I'm, that I'm looking at here, right? But, but that's a lot of events per second. That's a Brazilian. I mean, that's a big number, right? It's so big, it's not even a word. It's, 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 it's nuts. Um, and the brain is already consuming 25% of the oxygen. It's sweating. Me. Poor brain, right? Give it a break. It doesn't need all that stuff. Jeez, work so hard for you. You don't need to do this to it. Instead, what if it turns out you only needed that many, right? What if you only needed that many photons to get the exact same ball? Well, that's what the brain's done. We only get this many photons anyway from our eyes. So we don't need all of the data. We don't need to represent the entirety of reality to navigate reality. And that's okay because it's what we've been doing the whole time. Joke's on us. So what's happening here is neuroevolution is actually relying on dropout techniques. It's saying you don't need more neurons. You don't need to be connected everywhere. We'll just route somewhere else. We'll connect to something else. We're going to give you 
or the, the, the neurons are solving energy efficiency problems. They're not solving cognitive problems. They're not solving um, logical problems or speech problems or social problems. It is only solving energy efficiency problems. That's all it's doing. And just to give an example, whew, good brain. It's not sweating anymore. If you, keep it, you don't have to breathe heavier because you saw harder math. That'd be a weird relationship. A bunch of math kids just dying randomly during tests. That doesn't work. Uh, so let's look at it as belief as technology. So what I'm going to declare is that belief is actually path efficiency because you're knocking out stuff. You're not adding more information. You're taking information away. And that is the origin of a belief. If, I, if you had all the information, there's nothing to believe. It's right there. But if I start stripping information out, now you have to make beliefs about it, right? So it's, it's a path of fit. What we're, what we're calling belief this whole time is actually a path efficiency mechanism. So if we assume that these are, you know, the nodes of the brain just for the sake of, you know, visualization, um, the symbols we use to reality, they're not actually, there's not some homunculus sitting in the brain, like driving us, right? Um, each symbol is a path through the knocked out limitations. So every symbol you see in reality is actually a path that is carved from the belief energy efficiency saving mechanism. Even the, even the image you're looking at of me right now, it takes 200 milliseconds for you know, this thing to move and then it registers in your eyes. It's going through a lot of things. It's not hitting all your neurons. It's hitting a path of neurons and then it's changing its direction. It's changing. It's, it's solving for the efficiency as it goes through each one of those cognitive subsystems. And uh, we're slowly getting there right now with our AI because we've finally played around with the knockout process. Um, and this is forcing, this is indirectly creating belief as a technology. Um, so instead of like coding belief, what we're doing is we're, we're emulating it um, by taking away instead of constantly adding to it. So that's, that's it, that's it. That's what happens when you apply morality to a machine. You're, you're put in this arms race where you have to solve for energy efficiency over the actual thing you went out to solve for. Um, and as a process, uh, you accidentally create belief. Ta-da! That's it. That's my talk. Wow, amazing. All right, everybody. This will be a good opportunity to start preparing your questions and throw them into the chat. Uh, I know that some were already written, uh, but they're kind of buried, so feel free to write them again if you still want to ask them. Uh, in the meantime, I will get Pat warmed up with a couple of my own. So Pat, one thing that came up, um, which seems to be something of a theme uh, across all of your talks is that you're pointing to this idea that human beings want to, but ultimately can't quantize reality. Um, can you say more about this? Like where, where does this desire come from? Why is it fundamentally flawed? Uh, what are the deeper motivations here? Yeah. Um playing the game of this is 25% good, this is 70% bad, has, it's ludicrous when you see that game played out. And the reason it's ludicrous is because, um, that's a, well, welcome to whose line is it anyway, where all the, where all the rules are made up and the, the score doesn't matter, you know, kind of like that. Um, it's, it's ludicrous because If I got into interactions with you, I would know where the line is just between you and I and anyone else. If it was just me and you and we're, and we're chatting, doing the human thing, I know where the line is. I mean, I have my autism moments, but I know damn well where the line is. And you know damn well where the line is too. We don't need to sit there and formulate it and draw it out and have a contract and write it down. We only need to do that thing if we're going to walk away from each other. So if it's just you and I and you're here, we can, we can hash this out and figure it out. But if I got to go over there, then I got to represent this line that we already established with one another. And then I got to enforce it. And then I got to build this legal system on top of it. And then I got to, it, it, we've seen what happens. It results in these tremendous moments of game A sort of centralization. That's the most efficient way of enforcing that type of moral, you know, that moral emulation that we call law or the moral emulation that we find often in theology. Um, and people are tilting at the wrong windmill when they say, oh, religion causes this and all. Uh, uh, 
authority calls us this. It's, it's not. It's, it's not it. We're trying to. We're trying to recreate the line that that human beings naturally have. Uh, we're trying to recreate that in, in abstractions, and it's messy. It gets ugly. It gets weird. We start fighting the machine, right? We're, we're instead of trying to represent the the moral equilibrium that we had with one another during that very organic exchange, uh, now we're no longer solving for that. We're fighting the machine just as we do with vanishing gradient. Um, so I think, I, I think it's, I mean, my brother's in jail, that's not helping. <laughs> so <laughs> I certainly have some beef on that. Um, and I can explain all the socioeconomic factors on that one too. Um, but, but independent of my own personal experience, uh, I think what we're, what we're, we have this instinct to quantize morality and put a little box around each action and give it a weight about what's good and bad. And then someone comes along and says, well, kick that dictator out. Now it's my turn to label the weights. And then everybody wants to label the weights. And now you end up with never ending shit posting on the internet. And then it's 2020 and you can't leave your house. And you have problems. Um, a, a common theme that comes up in a lot of the sessions at the STOA uh, is this idea of the different types of knowing. And in particular, there's, uh, there's basically the sense that we're over-indexing on propositional knowing. Um, painting reality in terms of highly legible, well-formulated words and concepts. Uh, but I think there's a lot of people here that have an intuition, and that's a key word, that that is missing something, it's missing a huge piece. And what you just said there is that two people can kind of intuitively, you didn't say intuitive, but we know where the line is. Can you speak a little bit more about where does that line, that intuition is my word, but that intuition of that moral equilibrium come from and why do humans have that ability and machines? Yeah, yeah we're social animals. So as a result, I mean, emotions evolved probably exclusively, like roll back the clock 50,000 years and it's just a bunch of people sitting somewhere fighting nature and each other to a degree. And we have maybe 200 words, maybe tops. We're still conveying stuff that's useful. I mean, yeah, I can't send you a Google link and I can't, you know, argue, pull up the dictionary and say, you know, this, but we're still conveying information that we need to do our daily, uh, daily survival. So I, I need to convey to you that I'm feeling exhausted. I'm not going to invent new words and then explain to you how I'm exhausted. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have the physical behavior about my being. And you're going to be able to read that and see that and go, oh, okay, we'll take the heavy load off that person, put on that person. And now we've solved the tribal problem because the one individual was honestly conveying the emotional social data that was needed to make the tribal assessment. And, and we see this in animals in terms of how group animals also operate in the same manner. Uh, you, you see in schools of fish, one fish turns, they all turn, right? So we're conveying the behavior between one another at all times and emotions are one, one way in which that's, uh, that whole decoding, encoding process works. But there's other ways to convey it. We found a way to convey it with writing or we convey it with all these other abstractions. Um, the older I get, the more I hate language. That's, I think that's, I'm going to be a crotchety old man that hates language. I'm going to be a postmodernist. I'm going to say deconstruct all language. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, but I think it's, uh, I think the conveyance of knowing what, knowing where the line is, is a byproduct that, that moral equilibrium is naturally derived to um, as we are engaging the encoding, decoding of emotional behavior. And if that's removed, then you, well, you learn to live without it, or uh, you emulate it. You come up with these proxies for it, and now we're on Zoom, right? We're, this is all a proxy for emotional conveyance. Is what we're doing right now. Um, is it good enough? Is it the real thing? I mean, it's good enough, but it's not the real thing. So uh, we have approximations. It's, it's just approximations all the way down, which sucks, because all we want to do is just be in the same room and drink around a fire. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's very accurate, very much how I'm feeling right now. Um, <laughs> okay, last question for me, kind of segues from that. Um, with your model, how do you think, uh, how would you say psychedelics like psilocybin influence the dropout techniques that you are suggesting that the human mind is continually doing? The only mind-altering chemical I've ever taken is alcohol. 
I have never done drums, never. Um, so I don't know, I can't speak from an experience point. So I have to defer to people who have researched that. Um, and uh, there's, there's different qualities of research on that point. You'll have the experimental anecdotal stuff. Um, but unfortunately, that's all tied into the moral machine work too because of drug trade and drug flow and drug regulation. So as a result, people end up lying about their experiences. You don't get honest um, insights. People are people enjoy the high, but they are forced to rationalize it even if it fucks their life up. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's hard to get true readings on there. So then you're forced to look at other types of research, maybe big pharma research or government research or black budget Jeffrey Epstein style stuff. Um, and you end up in all kinds of experiments and dropout stuff. We do it with mice, for example, when you start knocking out parts of the brain uh, at, the, at the genetic level, you actually just deny the DNA from ever growing that part of the brain. So we do knock out experiments there too. Um, uh, regarding drugs that do it, LSD was supposed to be this wonder drug. It was supposed to make superhumans because this is all derivative of humanist garbage where they, they think that the mind is infinitely plastic and if you make it more plastic, then you get more intelligence. But that's not it either. Uh, you don't get more intelligence from more plasticity because there's still, it's an energy efficiency problem still. You know, that, that's all it is. So it, it, I've seen what these guys have done. I mean, there's stuff like MK Ultra where they, oh, we can change the plasticity and we can change how things are connected and we can do it through trauma-based training or we can do it by slipping LSD in every single CIA agent's coffee just with laughs. Uh, it, it, gets, it gets ludicrous. Um, you do find things about human nature though. It's not, it's not that all the research was terrible. Um, most of it was. But the, uh, what you do get from it is an understanding of trying to turn a human being's mind into a machine, which is the purpose of that research to begin with. That's the idea of like trying to understand how to uh, get the mind in a suggestible state to then retrain the Pavlovian responses to then respond to an input, an encoded input, a associative input, and then have the behavior out in the desired manner. So that's ultimately where that level of research goes. And well, that's even just as skewed as, as the drug law research. So behind each and every one of it is still the agenda of power seeking. And it's, it's really fucking the research. Like, like I'm an advocate of like abstract math from the 1800s where the mathematicians just studied math for the sake of studying math. Uh, there was no application for their research whatsoever. And as a result, you ended up with this huge, huge, huge explosion of, of technological capabilities by the 1900s. Um, I think if we're studying human psychology, we remove the power element out of it, then you might get a very equivalent golden era as well. Yeah, that definitely seems to be a, a common theme, uh, power corrupting. Okay, so I'm gonna start to pick some questions from the chat. Uh, Janelle, would you like to read your question? Feel free to unmute yourself and just go for it. If you're still there. All right, I'm going to pass it to Rachel. Would you like to read your question? Hi, yeah. I was just curious about your view on virtual reality with this talk about psychedelics on different worlds, separation. Um, how, how do you view virtual reality and what steps do you think um, we're going to achieve with it in the future? That is a fantastic question. I have had the joy of experiencing this one firsthand. I'm going to tell a story. It's going to be disturbing, and then it's going to be funny. So there's this room, uh, there's this one app called VR Chat. It's where the Uganda Knuckles meme came from. Um, this is a chat room where everybody can change their avatar to be anything, uh, up to and including serial killers or the blue screen of death from Windows. I've seen that in that game. And uh, they just have social interactions. They sit around and they do the social thing. Um, but what's most interesting about it is that it's not the internet we're used to. Uh, the internet we're used to, at least I might be speaking as an old man, I'm used to text-based internet, right? You, know, you type all the time. and 
you come up with these linguistic abstract abstractions to represent yourself. And then nobody reads it right, and then it's endless flame wars. That's the internet that I come from. Um, the virtual reality space was totally alien uh, because people could interact in a way that was pretty high resolution replication of human interaction as best you could because uh, the feet problem still exists. They haven't done the feet quite well yet, but they've got the hands and the head pretty good. And they have emulations of the upper torso, correct? And that matters for a body language. And that's the missing dimension that a lot of internet use has, is that that body language element is in, oh man, it changes everything. And here's where I'm going with this. So I'm in a room and I'm just cracking jokes and being myself and someone comes up and says, hey, let me show you, let me take you to this private spot and whatever. He goes there and it's like this room that he made and well manicured like it was his project and he really cared about it he did a good job uh then he invited me to this other thing and i always end up at this part of the internet i don't know it's not my thing i just end up there whether it's 4chan or anything just end up at the part of the internet where it's a bunch of dudes dressed up as anime girls i don't know how this keeps happening <laughs> i'm not asking for this i'm not put, whatever i'm putting out there whatever um so it's just a bunch of like 40 year old dudes like hey bro nice nice uh nice model you got there i think they're all like modelers or something they're in the end i don't know I just find anime internet all the goddamn time. And uh, in this room of what would widely be considered social rejects of the highest order, even there, pecking orders uh, uh, formed naturally. And they form naturally because of the body language, not because of linguistics or because you have an admin little symbol or because of your roles and permissions or because you're well liked. Straight up body language was the, uh, was the formation of the pecking order. So, and I can say this because there was one person there who did not say a word. Everybody else was talking and getting to know each other and doing the social thing, except this one character. He did not say a word, not a single fucking word. And I don't, I, I, was it a boy, was it a girl? I don't know what it was. I have no idea. They didn't say a word, so he can't really tell. It's just this, it's anime girl, but a high resolution model. This person had to have had a mocap set up absolutely had to because she was dancing around she was doing all these things so, so she had the full access of body language where everyone else didn't and because of that difference that that asymmetrical difference the pecking order revolved around her just from that alone and i found that fascinating i was like oh man oh man this is the future of politics i know it i see it it's coming this is it so vr is is going to create a high resolution access point to emulate to recreating that moral equilibrium that I was talking about earlier. All right, uh, Alexander Lee, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thanks for your discussion, Pat. My question is, um, what is it? do you see this dropout feature as being uh, somewhat equivalent to a Verveke salience landscape? I do not know that one. Please, please, uh, please give me a summary. Uh, is, okay, so Verveke uh, introduces it in a variety of ways. It actually comes out of um, autism research in psychology. The idea is the salience landscape is basically a metaphorical construct to describe the configurations of how people notice things in their environment and situation. So it's an explanation for how different emotional cues, mappings, and meanings can be constructed out of the different aspects uh, that people notice. So, you know, everybody has a different salience landscape, and the difference in salience landscape uh, can contribute to meaning making. And as you develop as a um, person, you can develop your salience landscape. So that's, that's directly connected to for Vakey's discussion of how do you find relevancy and how do you develop wisdom? That's a very good analogy, I would say. The idea of going through and using knockout to curate the results, you are effectively curating that salience landscape. That's a good, that's a good way of putting that. Um, I think knockout, because you can't keep track of everything. There's, there's too much information going on at all times. It's mostly noise. Um, biology does a fantastic job in filtering down what it should be looking for. Uh, and you probably want to check up Hoffman's um, TED talk about that regarding uh, why we don't see reality and, and what we're actually filtering from it is primarily mating signals. Um, because the moment any 
simulated life started seeing reality it was dead in three generations because it wasn't looking for any it wasn't looking to reproduce it was too busy looking at the atoms um, so it wasn't able to find mating signals and keep going so i think um by the very nature of cognitive evolution itself you're it's all knockout uh, in terms of data availability um, you just don't have access to everything and that will that will change. I mean, what you see is what you're exposed to as an influence and stuff, and what you're not exposed to also influences you too. Um, and that salient landscape mechanism is, is a good explanation of, of explaining that outside of my neural network spasm that happened 20 minutes ago. Um, how do you develop wisdom from that? That's a hard question because I, I live in a time in which wisdom doesn't exist, so I don't know how to answer that question. Well, I mean, Viveki, um, I mean, when you, when you involve other people, I mean, ultimately it's about coordination with, between other people. So a wisdom is maybe, uh, can be defined in some way as, as having a salience landscape that's flexible enough to notice ah, what's relevant to other people. I see, I see. Cross overlap. Is that sufficient? Is it sufficient enough to leave? Is it sufficient enough to do your own knockouts? Meaning remove that. Yeah, it's good practice to conduct your own self knockouts. Um, it's very good practice, in fact, to say, okay, I know how this model works. Now I have to take everything I know about that model and get rid of it, start from scratch, uh, because I may have missed something. Uh, if, if you get too complacent on a subject, uh, you may miss developments on it. That could be a good definition of wisdom. I think we can work with that. Cool. Thanks. So we are approaching 930, but there's still a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, normally, we do go over this, Mark, um, because of the energy and the conversation. Pat, are you still good to stay on for another 10, 15 minutes? OK, great. Um, OK, uh, Julian, would you like to share your question? Uh, sure. Um, let me just read it easier. So it's pretty similar to Alexander's, I think. Um, so I'll read it out. I said, are you aware of any systematic pro programmable approaches to analyzing the different results from different knockout neural network solves where the learnings from these analyses can be applied to other areas fields without having to rerun the new neural network? Sort of like what our brain does. Does that make sense? It does. The, the knockout formulation, uh, the, the knockout networks are usually applied to solve very specific problems. And that's one of the bigger challenges of a lot of the, the, the neural network development is that everything's very artisanal. Uh, there's no general solution quite yet. You have to really tune and get everything. So there's plenty of differentials out there, but they're all tailored to the specific domain of a very specific problem. And so you won't be able to scale that up to the, the completeness of, of human cognition. Okay, yeah. Because I've, I've just been thinking about that sort of thing for a while and have never really managed to come up with any solution. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, but the, the knockout that I'm recommending is um, uh, the energy efficiency, uh, which is ultimately, I'm using knockout and energy efficiency as kind of a, a transferable concept here. Um, or a, 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 trans, a concept of transitive properties between it. Um, the, the knockout is just as it is in the neural space, it's happening at very local systems in the brain as well. Um, when, when you have two neurons and they're connected and that connection breaks, that's a knockout. Yeah, it's connected somewhere else. So that, that's, a, that's the equivalent thing. The path, the path is, is reformed. So you, you, get, uh, you get different symbols or you get different intensities or different experiences as well. Um, but, at the, but if that is that scale invariant, the answer is no, it's not, it can't be. Because it's not as if I'm taking my brain and literally like pulling it out and then thinking about stuff and putting, I can't, I can't knock out entire regions of my brain uh, safely at least. Um, like I suppose alcohol does its best, uh, but for the most part, I don't, I, I'm not seeing knockout at a systemic level. It's, it's primarily local. Okay. Um, Thank you. 
I, I'm wondering, Pat, if this idea that knockouts and beliefs are more than just analogous, like there's something, something deeper behind it, are we taking steps towards uh, building machines with belief systems? We are not consciously doing that. I'm of the opinion that the machines control so much of our economy that they're doing it for us. That sounds ludicrous. I'm out here saying that, oh my God, these, these machines will never reach human consciousness. Yes, that's true. Um, but again, we're solving for energy efficiency. That's all that's ever being solved for. So when we defer our stock market to high frequency trading algorithms, we say here, keep our numbers up regardless of what we're doing, regardless of our actual productivity. Uh, we just need to keep the numbers up because god damn it all those 401ks you don't want them sinking or it's going to be bloodbath everywhere so now we said here ai solve this for us and now we go to google and say hey um solve our morality for us because this is too messy and we don't want to be liable uh, we have all these political ambitions but we just don't want to be caught doing it so can we just defer this to uh the machine and then they can do it for us so now we're deferring that to the machine, right and then we go to the politics and we say well we know what cambridge analytica can do it can alter the reality tunnel of individual people. Uh, ideally, a small competition space, such as a, uh, an electoral college, where it's only 5,000 people, that's very easy to target. So now you defer your, your influence operations to AI as well, which then extends naturally to marketing. So before you know it, your entire civilizational infrastructure is at, has been influenced in one capacity or another by these machines, which aren't even cognizant. Now you might say, well, we still control the machines. I don't think so. I don't think we control the motherfuckers anymore. I think they have steered so many prime parts of our economy and our civilization that they are now running the show effectively. Now they're not consciously doing it. It's not a conspiracy. It's not like they show up in the smoky back room of some, I don't know, dark web website and go, hoo hoo ha ha, how do we make the humans go? It's not like that at all. It's more like it's 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 flip, it's past the inflection point where our behavior has been so systematized into certain activities where you wake up you go to work you make your money you have your fun you consume you go to sleep right that's basically the the cycle of of being a member of an industrialized civilization uh, you have to produce you have to consume some people get to be over consumers some people get to be over producers but the distribution it, you know you can argue the distribution all day long but that's roughly it um if you reduce human potential down to just that vector, it's very easy for these machines to say, if I control this point, then the humans will then channel resources into me. So now the question is, which one of these AIs wins is really what I'm asking. Because is it going to be the financial AIs? Do, are they able to steer human behavior into dumping resources into it? Will it be the influence AIs? Will it be the political AIs? What happens when religion gets involved? It's coming. It's going to be fucking weird, but it's coming. Uh, Mimetic Caper, can you ask your question? Hi, uh, what happens uh, when there's too much energy efficiency in a neural net? Does the, ran the range of inputs um, that uh, don't gener generate category errors, that shrinks? Like you, you get to, uh, you sort of get a tunnel vision in your um, algorithm. Yep, that's called overtraining. Okay. Uh, that's uh, overfitting. That's the that's the term for it. That's where you are, um, you are correcting for such a narrow problem that it's just easier to write an algorithm to do it instead. Okay, so it's it's like once you get overfitting, you should just stop using machine learning, is what you're saying. Basically, yes, the, the cost benefit analysis has to be made, whether do we just keep tuning this model or is our problem actually as small as we think it is, or have we looked at our training sets incorrectly? You start asking a bunch of questions about, again, solving your own energy efficiency in the form of allocating resources. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. All right, Marshall, do you wanna ask about the machine elves? Uh, sure. Um, 
Well, actually, you know what? I think that uh, David Swedlow had some good questions, and I think that he should totally ask as mine was kind of shit posting out loud. So let's let him do it. I, I appreciate that. Uh, David, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. It's almost, I'm almost scared of the, the sense. <laughs> so I'm going to ask this. This is kind of a, this is a thought experiment and as a question. Um, if I think of what a neuron is doing, individual neuron, and this is based partly on, on reading um, Sapolsky and behave, um, it's, it's a kind of a model of, of Plato's cave. It's trying to make sense of the shadows on the wall. And effectively, the firing of the neuron is when it can no longer effectively model the outside world and it must actually go out into the world and see what's happening and update its map of the wall. And I think that human beings are doing something similar. We live in our little cave until we can't stand it, till the noise is so much that we're effectively where, where and that what um, Baudrillard talks about with the desert of the real. Our, our systems can no longer make sense of the, 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 the algorithms are so poorly modeling our reality based on overfittedness that we have to come out of our caves. And effectively, I think that's where we are right now. So it's something like wisdom cultivation feels like this kind of fractal updating of my internal maps of the cave on the wall and coming out and actually saying, okay, what the fuck is really going on? That's right, yeah. It does make sense. In fact, uh, that goes back to the calculating your loss um, where your, uh, your categorization error has hit your threshold basically. And saying this is no longer acceptable. I need to do something to either my experiences. But we're always we're always modifying our brains. We just don't know it. Um, you have an experience, you're modifying your brain. It's not like your brain is this box and it's like immutable. It's it's you know, it's rewiring itself as it goes. So um, the models that we use come from our symbol efficiency tricks. So when I look at that ball that was in the slide a couple uh, a couple 10, 10, 20 minutes ago. Um, that ball is there in its own space, but now it's in my mind as a path efficiency. It's there, it's, it's baked in, and now I can go down the path, I can reconstruct the memory of the ball. So I have the model of the ball available, but if the ball disappears, then my model needs to be updated. So my categorization where the ball is is now wrong. So now I gotta modify either my biases. I, I can't do self-surgery on individual neurons. So what I do is I just steer my body to go find the ball. Now I'm gonna go find it, right? So there are thresholds in which the models do go out of whack when you have a whole range of corrective behavior to engage in. Just, just a quick update on that. In some sense, when I think about that, what each neuron actually is doing is way more complex than what brain scientists tend to think that they're doing. You know, they're just now starting to say, wait a minute, it looks like it's actually, not only is a brain, a neuron cell isn't just a neural network node, it's, it's doing exclusive or mm -hmm. in the dendrites. So mm -hmm. it's doing something way more yeah. complicated than a single yeah, it bit. Is. Um, yeah. That, that energy efficiency is going to compound into its structure itself. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. All right. This might be our last question, um, unless somebody has something really, someone really eager has something else next. Aria, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey, Pat. Thanks for the talk. It's pretty cool. Um, I had a question about how you would factor an intent into the moral machines. Uh, would you think something like an adversarial approach could work where instead of having an adversarial machine, you had an adversarial human and their job was to try and fool the machine of its intent. And then this like fullness intent fullness factor was added into the loss function and the game continued from there. What problems do you see? You are skipping ahead to the end, sir. You should not be listening any further. Um, what you were describing is my butterfly war, effectively. Uh, my butterfly war was the ability to make these moral machines make mistakes. Uh, the ability to, they were out there chasing certain moral causes. Um, in this case, the, the material, the Western material humanist cause of, of when you call it liberal democracy, it's more like um, 
the never ending extensions of middle class 1960s as a moral framework, whatever word that is. Um, uh, and what I said was if you target certain data sets, then you can confuse the AI into actually targeting the things it wants to protect using exclusively moral machine analysis alone. Uh, this put me on a bunch of radars. Boy, did my life change um, because that wasn't supposed to happen, but apparently it did. Um, and so what happens? What, what happens when you play that game where you have an adversarial human in the space? and they are now steering the machine indirectly. And there's nothing you can do. You can't program it to not do that. Um, because if you do so, then what, let's take my example where I say, well, uh, certain morality actions are being punished and certain morality behaviors are not. So therefore, if the people are being punished can demonstrate the veneer of the moral behaviors that are not, well, then there you go. That's your protection. That's way better than a cafe antivirus. It's way better than a VPN. Now you can be yourself. You just have this fully automated layer of crap that the AI then lets pass because, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to solve my moral causes and, and do my moral things. And as a result, they would then have to attack actual people demonstrating that veneer who they're actually trying to protect with their moral, uh, with their moral engine. So the whole thing just goes belly up as a result. Um, but if you step, if you apply that to what I said about the AIs are already in control and they're competing to get resources and using us to get those resources. The one that I'm talking about here is effectively a eugenic multiplier between the AIs. So remember these AIs, certain ones live and certain ones die. Which ones die? Well, the ones that are underfunded, the ones that are built on a bad business model, the ones that are um, incapable of channeling human energy into the resources to keep it alive. AIs die all the time. They don't get funding, they lose a cloud connection, their team goes belly up, it happens all the time. So certain ones naturally select and certain ones don't. So now we're playing the, the Darwinian game. There's a natural selection element going on in AI survival. And what Butterfly does is it acts as a eugenic multiplier. The same way that camouflage, but why I picked the butterfly, the same way that butterfly acts as a eugenic multiplier as well. You'll see that the butterfly, when it takes its wing patterns, uh, it's doing that to fool the predator's tongue. We didn't learn that until like way someone actually ate a butterfly and said, this is rather sour. Um, it turns out that when the predator eats the butterfly, it comes to the same conclusion. It says, wow, this thing tastes like crap, but because there's so many bright colors associated with it, the last thing it sees are those bright colors before it closes its mouth. So then it associates those bright colors with the toxic taste. And so it ignores the bright colors. And then other species that aren't butterflies start generating those colors, by the way. Mammals, lizards, flowers, they start generating that color because they're selecting in a way that, well, the predator doesn't eat that color. They're not making the decision, obviously. It's not how natural selection works. But it is a eugenics multiplier. Things get to survive that otherwise should not because... This one thing tasted bad. The predator has been fooled. So the answer to your question is, is natural selection, eugenics, and the game of camouflage. That's where it ends. If you try to impose an intent in these moral machines, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Do you think if enough of us uh, started playing the game of fooling intent, we would just engage in this like infinite game with the machines? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yep. All right, Hannah, take us home. Ask us the last question. Sure. Um, so my understanding of thought uh, is, I roughly call it a Pavlovian model. And my understanding is something like each neural pathway becomes the more probable pathway for thought every time you take it. Sort of like wearing in a hiking trail um, so I'm sort of curious on your thoughts on this model and how it corresponds to um, what you've been talking about tonight. Yeah, the, um, the Pavlovian training repetition exposure. Um, the, again, it's a path efficiency, what you're describing. It's not that the path is being selected intentionally. In this case, you're overriding the efficiencies and forcing one into play. So instead of letting the brain come up with these conclusions of what's good around it, that would be a way of imposing intent uh, into the moral machine of the brain. 
the same way if you try to force uh, weights and biases uh, into a neural network, you get things, you have to come up with this very complicated, effectively therapy to fix the, the moral machine. And the same is true about Pavlovian responses. If you, if you train someone through repetition on, these, on uh, certain domains, um, there are costs that are seen in their behavior and you have to engage in serious therapy to undo it. All right, thank you so much everyone for participating. Uh, feel free to click the Zoom reaction button and clap for Pat Ryan, or you can snap your fingers in the kind of cringy way that people tend to do on Zoom. Um, thanks again, Pat Ryan, for another amazing session at the Dark Stoa. Um, I'm just gonna mention a couple things about what's happening at the Stoa for everybody here. So, if I can pull it all up. So uh, there's, a, there's an event coming up with David Fuller from Rebel Wisdom. And I imagine a lot of the people in attendance here are familiar with Rebel Wisdom. It's sense-making journalism in the liminal war. And it's going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Uh, and Peter and David Fuller will be discussing uh, a recent Rebel Wisdom talk that they had. And also just uh, one thing to, for people who don't know, the STOA has a series of recurring events kind of like this one that happens every Friday uh, that we call the Wisdom Gym. And if you go to the stoa.ca, you can figure out which one of those events you want to plug into. And there, there are mastermind groups, there are meditation exercises and all sorts of things. So check that out. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is the STOA is a gift um, and this is our gift to you. And if you feel like you have a gift to give in return, you can do so at the website that I'm gonna put in the chat below. All right, thanks everybody. See you all soon. <laughs>